there's a wealth of laboratory evidence that these anti-tumor properties kill cancer cells in a variety of ways. There are multiple mechanisms of action identified by which cannabis kills cancer cells. And they're divided into various categories. And among these are anti-proliferative effects. Normally, that's, that's one of the hallmarks of a cancer cell is that it just keeps reproducing. So if you stop the reproduction, that's an anti-proliferative effect. There are anti-angiogenesis effects, and this means that the cannabinoids will stop the tumor from being able to elaborate or grow new blood vessels to support the growth of the tumor. There are anti-metastatic effects, and that is simple enough to mean that the cannabinoids block the ability of the cancer cells to spread into other tissues. And there's another uh, effect that has a wild name, apoptotic effect. Apoptosis refers to the ability of cannabinoids to speed the death of the abnormal cells. And that's something that is, is especially important in cancer because you're, you're able to hasten the death of the cell without disturbing the normal cells around it. Seth Research Laboratories in California have recently demonstrated that in some tumors, cancer cells are killed by marijuana, while the other healthy cells are left untouched. Cells that stop moving and become still white dots are dead cancer cells. The ability of cannabinoids to kill bad cells while protecting healthy ones is particularly important when we're talking about brain cancer because of the so-called blood-brain barrier. The brain has to be sheltered from outside influences that might hitch a ride on the bloodstream and cause havoc. What is exciting and unique about cannabinoids is that they can pass through the blood-brain barrier because of their slippery, fat-loving nature. Cannabinoids get right into the brain's cancer cells by moving easily through the cell's membranes, which are also composed of lipids. The evidence is piling up in mice-infested labs that the endocannabinoid system, when stimulated by cannabinoids, has an anti-tumor effect and can instruct cancer cells to commit suicide. This was done by Manuel Guzman's group uh, within the past less than 10 years, and what they showed there was that originally that THC, when injected into a brain tumor in mice and rats, uh, a significant number of those animals, would the tumor would regress and disappear, so that you actually had survival of rats that, uh, that would otherwise die. And they examined all the surrounding nerve tissue, and that was all fine, because remember, once again, cannabinoids protect nerves. Dr. Manuel Guzman is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology in Madrid, Spain, and is known for his groundbreaking studies on medical cannabis. Hemos observado que los cannabinoides tienen un efecto inductor de la muerte de las células tumorales, un efecto inhibidor de lo que es el crecimiento, la multiplicación de las células tumorales, lo que hacen es disminuir el crecimiento de los tumores. If cannabis might be the miracle cancer cure that everybody's been searching for, then why don't doctors everywhere know about it? People have a hard time believing that cannabis can have all of these fantastic effects that are described. But what we're doing is we're just stimulating a natural system that's already there. This has been developing for hundreds of millions of years. The early, the invertebrates, the sea squirts, the hydra, there are primitive endocannabinoid systems in those organisms back, dating back six, seven hundred million years ago. The cannabis plant came along maybe 50 or 60 million years ago. Why aren't billions in funds being directed toward cannabinoid research by the organizations that raise money for cancer therapies? We're talking about medical research that, you know, it's really a double-edged sword. On, on the one hand, I'm thrilled that there's really more research taking place now uh, really, than any time in history when it comes to the therapeutic use of cannabis and specifically the cannabinoids, the components in cannabis. You know, unfortunately, a lot of that research is still relegated to uh, taking place overseas. We see a little bit now finally taking place in this country, but really the United States remains fairly well behind the curve when it comes to cutting edge medical cannabis research. One of the first labs to um to demonstrate basically that 
not only the immune cells, the normal immune cells express these cannabinoid receptors called the CB2 receptors, but also that when these immune cells get transformed and they become cancer, to our surprise we found that these cancer cells continue to express these CB2 receptors. This was an exciting discovery because the CB2 receptor can act like a target for the cannabinoids. Once they bind with the receptor, they can tell the cancer cell to die. So basically telling the cells basically to commit suicide and that's what they do. And uh, we demonstrated that that would be the mechanism by which the cannabinoids can kill the cancer and therefore it can be used effectively as an anti-cancer agent. Dr. Niagara Cotty and his researchers were able to eradicate almost 100 percent of the cancer in test tubes, but they were skeptical they would see similar results when they moved on to tumors in mice. To our surprise we found that almost uh, 25 to 30 percent of the mice completely rejected the tumor. They were completely cured and uh, in addition we found that the remaining mice uh, also there was um, a significant reduction in the volume or the size of the tumors as well. The lab results have been so promising that Dr. Niagara Cotty is beginning clinical trials with leukemia patients. There's no doubt in his mind that the cannabinoids, either from the plant or lab created, will play a major role in medicine in the future. I feel that in the next five or ten years there, there is going to be exponential growth in cannabinoid research. It's an area where both the critics and the advocates agree. Scientists are now well on their way to developing medicines based on the cannabinoids. It begs the question, however, will modern medicine eventually make the marijuana plant obsolete? No, it will not. In fact, it will only enhance it. Okay, because now it's more proof that the plant really does work. Okay, and instead of spending $600 a month, on buying the pharmaceutical drug. I can grow my own plants. I don't want them to ever take the choice away because I don't know how long it's going to be before they really find out exactly what is working for me or for others. And right now having the raw plant available is the best solution because you have all of it there. You don't have just what they've isolated, just what they've decided is important now. Let's keep it in the corridors of science. Let's keep it in the FDA. Let's do what needs to be done, which is careful, longitudinal, placebo-controlled, crossover, head-to-head -head studies, and see where it falls out. But let's deliver what's really medicine. That is the individual cannabinoids. They may come across some things that are better than herbal marijuana for one thing or another, and good luck to them. I'd love that. But I never want to see compromised the capacity of people to use herbal marijuana, whether it's because the drug that they've come up with is much more expensive, or it doesn't do as well, or whatever the reason, the people should always have herbal marijuana available to them without any constraints from the law. Patients say for now the question is irrelevant. Science has not yet given them the opportunity to choose between an effective pill or the plant. This is something where I have no other medical... What is the evidence that marijuana smoking, habitual marijuana smoking, can lead to lung cancer? With respect to the development of lung cancer, uh, we uh, found no evidence of any increased risk of lung cancer uh, occurrence in association with marijuana smoking alone. The marijuana smokers, if anything, had a reduced risk for developing lung cancer. Not a significantly reduced risk, but reduced less than a one-fold, so that means reduced. Whereas the tobacco smokers had a markedly increased risk if uh, th those who smoke more than two packs a day had a 20-fold increase in the risk, that's 2,000 percent. Those who smoke from one to two uh, packs a day uh, had an eight-fold risk, it's 800 percent. Um, so that contrasts with no risk, no increased risk, or any a slightly reduced risk with the marijuana smokers. THC actually has an anti-tumoral effect. 
And uh, these are studies that were done both in experimental animals and in cell culture systems and for different kinds of cancer. For lung cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, gliomas, brain cancer, that the development and growth, or the growth actually of the tumor is, is suppressed by THC and metastases are also suppressed. So how can that be? Well, THC impairs protein synthesis and it's what we call anti-mitogenic or anti-proliferative. You need, so tumor cells don't as readily proliferate in the presence of THC. They're also uh, anti-angiogenic so they interfere with the growth and development of new blood vessels that are necessary for metastatic spread. And they also are pro-apoptotic. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is program cell death. So when cells age, there is a mechanism whereby the cells die. Uh, it's a non-necrotic death to die off the old cells and the, we get rid of them before they have an opportunity to develop mutations that would lead to cancer. So enhancing apoptosis diminishes the risk of the cells becoming cancerous. So marijuana turns out, THC rather, turns out to be pro-apoptotic. So those appear to be the mechanisms that might account for these anti-tumoral effects of THC. We decided to do our own case control study funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a major funding agency for marijuana-related research. This was the largest study uh, ever conducted on this subject. It was very well designed. We used the uh, Los Angeles uh, Tumor Registry to identify, rapidly ascertain, all the cases of lung cancer and head and neck cancer <clears throat> that occur, that were diagnosed in the LA County system. And uh, of course, by the time we got to some of them, they'd already died or they were too sick. But we got to it, over 60% of them who agreed to participate and uh, were able to participate. And we administered this questionnaire. And then we matched them to controls, the uh, same age, socioeconomic status, that lived in the same neighborhood using an algorithm that USC developed for this purpose so that we could match, you know, we're comparing apples with apples. And then we administered the, this detailed questionnaire at the food frequency questions, occupational history, all kinds of things. We also did molecular, uh, we got uh, a buckle smear so we could look at the DNA, could we look at the genetics of lung cancer. Uh, so what we did was to recruit uh, uh, smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana. Um, at least a joint a day for a week, and it ended up that the average smoker of marijuana whom we recruited smoked three joints a day for about 15 years. And um, uh, that's we also required that they smoke that much for five years, but on the average they smoked three joints for 15 years, so that's about 45 to 50 joint years. A joint year is, is the number of joints smoked uh, times the number of years smoked over the study population was, I think, be between 35 and 59. I think 35 was a younger age group. Because we thought that they had to be uh, teenagers in the early 20s at the time of the, at least in the marijuana epidemic, which you know was in the, in the mid 60s. So prior to that time, very few people used marijuana, but after that time, it just mushroomed up to 1979, which represented actually the apex the acme of use of marijuana in our society. So that we, that's why we chose those age limits. And so what did we find? Uh, for any category of cannabis use, including heavy use, heavy use we define as more than 10 joint years, but we looked at 20 joint years and three joint years. For every category of marijuana use, the ratio was less than one, meaning reduced risk. It wasn't significantly reduced, but it was reduced. With, uh, and the confidence intervals were not that, that wide uh, around the point estimate. So there was no evidence, and we controlled for all the known or putative factors, uh, for socioeconomic status, concomitant, tobacco smoking, alcohol, etc. At the same time when we did a similar analysis for the tobacco smokers, there was a huge effect of tobacco. 